to describe our interconnectedness. As a vine with many branches, or as one loving entity in which we all dwell or abide, or as a body with many parts. However we describe it, we gather today in worship as one people brought together in Christ. And this single candle signifies that togetherness, shining for us, in us, with us, and between us. United in Christ, let us worship God. Amen. I invite you now to bring to mind special places in nature and to consider these places not only as beautiful or majestic or intricate or whatever specific quality makes them special, but to also consider the sacredness of these special places. There are places in our experience that bring us close to the holy creative intentions of God. As you spend a few moments pondering this, perhaps you are able to look at this special place or find an image that you can look at. As you do that, I want you to let your imagination wander to the people before you who have also sensed that sacredness in that place. In this circle of awe and wonder, we give thanks to God. We give thanks for the indigenous people whose relationship with these amazing places reaches back millennia and we commit ourselves to walk softly on this land and gently in our relationships. We commit ourselves to wise stewardship and as an affirming congregation we commit ourselves to broad welcome even as we humbly acknowledge the sacredness of this place and the gifts of those who have held that sacredness across the ages of time. I am the true vine and my father the gardener, says Jesus to his gathered disciples in his farewell address to them in the 15th chapter of John. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. How would it impact us if we understood our lives as individuals and even more than that as a church as organically, completely connected to Jesus Christ? In today's worship service, we'll have three briefer reflections, taking the place of a single sermon, each one exploring this question from a slightly different angle. Welcome all to this time of worship.
morning. Our scripture reading this morning is John 15 verses 1 to 8. Jesus, the true vine. I am the true vine and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. We, as church and as individuals, are called to be people of integrity, practicing what we preach and recognizing our integrity in that other way, the integrating reality of Christ the true vine. A quote variously attributed to Caleb Miller or Eston Williams says, at the end of the day, I'd rather be excluded for who I include than included for who I exclude. This is what it is to understand ourselves as branches emanating from the vine that is Jesus. We go back to the Gospels, and when we do so, we hear Jesus telling parables that surprise us in who we are to regard as our neighbor. or stories that overturn our ideas of wealth and poverty. We see Jesus, where he goes, the company he keeps, his commitment to justice. We feel the touch of Jesus in our infirmity, even ailments that embarrass us or cause us to be secretive. And we feel the presence of the Holy Spirit promised by Jesus as we are moved to acts of love, compassion, and solidarity. Remembering all of those things from the life of Jesus, the true vine, remembering them as branches attached to that vine, we open ourselves to recognize love and embrace love and be uplifted by love and have our words and actions shaped by the affirming, boundless, ridiculously gracious love of Christ Jesus. Now, there's a degree of irony in all of this. In one way, living out all those things that we learn from Jesus is an awful lot of work. Paying attention to the needs of our neighbors, including the needs of nature and wildlife, requires attentiveness and persistence and action. Living by the inclusive values of Jesus requires some good old-fashioned gumption. Yet even as we are aware, are aware of all that we need to do in order for them to be some positive results in Jesus' name, to bear fruit, as John 15 would put it, we also acknowledge that perhaps the key to all of this is to open ourselves to Christ our source, the vine to which we are attached. Perhaps the hardest work is to let go so that we can allow Christ's love to flow into us and through us. I recognize and I celebrate my agency to make decisions about my life, and part of our call to be a non-racist and affirming church 
is to do everything possible to ensure that all people, regardless of their ethnicity or religion or education or sexual identity, have that same degree of agency. It is a significant part of our Christian calling to see and remove barriers, physical or attitudinal or legislative, that keep others from full participation. These are all quite individual things, but we do these individual actions because we understand all of us to be part of one entity, integrally connected branches emanating from one vine. And while the language of this is all very Christian, uh, Richard Rohr reminds us that this sense of being one goes far beyond a profession of Christian faith. God has infused love into all of creation, all living beings. In Christ, we recognize our oneness with all. But ours is not a call to exclusive rights and privileges, uh, extended only to this small sliver of folks that embrace Christ in a particular way. As we ponder this integrity, this oneness that connects us to Christ's love and connects us to one another in Christ's love, I invite you to a prayer that acknowledges our shared reliance on God, our Mother and Father, a sung version of the Lord's Prayer. For many, this is the time of year to get things ready for planting, readying ourselves to take advantage of all 56 days of our growing season. Today's image of a vine and branches that bear fruit, however, has a much longer timeline in mind. A wee bit of research by my good friend, Professor Google, tells me that a grapevine can have a fruit-bearing life of 50 to 100 years or even more with some of California's oldest vineyards having grapevines dating back to the 1880s. So when John 15 presents us with this image of a grapevine, it's not something whose life cycle begins and ends in a single growing season. It's an enduring vine 
which connects us to our history and our accountability. Now wouldn't it be grand if we could simplify life and say, you know, the past is past. I'm only responsible for things that happen now, starting today. Well, that of course is not how things work. No matter how gracious and forgiving we understand God to be, where we stand today includes appropriate accountability for what happened before, what got us to this place. As we travel along the vine that is Christ Jesus, reaching backward from this moment to the moment that God the gardener first planted the vine, we will encounter a lot of amazing, brave, prophetic people and movements. And we will also revisit some truly tragic, unconscionable things that have been done and continue to be done by the church and by ruling powers in the name of Jesus Christ. One of the reasons I celebrate what it is to be in the vine is that it keeps things real. It keeps me connected to all that history. It includes this ongoing accountability for the Christian Church, for these difficult seasons along the way, and for the ongoing consequences. I do not hold Christ responsible for these things, but Christ, the source of reconciliation and grace, expects me and us to address these injustices. In particular, um, I personally and we as a denomination have much to answer for in our relationship with the First Peoples of these lands. The calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission made this clear, if it wasn't before. I am a third generation United Church minister with a personal heritage of service dating back to about 1916. So there is no way for me to point to the legacy of residential schools and not accept some degree of personal family responsibility. And for us, as a congregation whose nearest United Church neighbor to the east is in Morley, we cannot point to this as someone else's problem. And so we engage in a process of reconciliation. We open ourselves to a shared pathway into a more just and loving future. I commend to you the efforts being made to make sure that any curriculum taught in Alberta schools does not minimize or deflect the story of the residential schools. I invite you to prayerfully engage in Red Dress Day, also known as Redress Day. We'll have a display up at Ralph Connor. There will be a drive-through display on May the 5th at St. Andrews United Church in Cochrane. There will be online gatherings as well. Links to all of these are found on the home page of our website, ralphconnor.ca. In the spirit of reconciliation, lament, and commitment to a new day, connected to our history in Christ the Vine. I invite you now to hear words from Glenda Crawler and Gloria Snow, words I was privileged to witness and record this past Wednesday. Part of the commitment to the calls to action through the TRC, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, we are working alongside of uh, Tony Snow, the Indigenous lead for the Chinook Winds region, and uh, we're advocating. One of the events in Cochrane is at the St. Andrews uh, United Church, and we will have a drive through installation of information, resources, and hanging of red dresses. So what's one thing you think people could do on this day uh, in remembrance on May 5th, Red Dress Day? I think the, I want the public to know about this, like we, we suffer a lot with our culture, like 
it was a residential school. Now it's uh, child welfare, and now it's murdering the women. Mm. And we need the public to know this. And we are always kept hidden in the reserve. Mm. We live in a third world. Mm. And we want, especially the government, has to listen to us and know the truth about Canada, the true history of Canada. They need to know that, all the people. And teach the children, my grandchildren, their grandchildren, teach the truth about Canada. Mm -hmm. You can't turn away from that. It, the truth has to come out. And so one of the things that we will be doing on Red Dress Day in honor of Jamie Black, the young student who started to hang dresses, as a sign of solidarity, we will wear red, we will sign, we will hang dresses, and we will have vigils to honor our involvement with murdered and missing Indigenous women in uh, Morley, in Cochrane, in Calgary, surrounding area. So again, I thank you, Ishnish Glenda, for this interview. It's a yes. painful subject to talk about, yes. but it's necessary. Yes. And if we could end off with a prayer. Yes. Um, we could do a short prayer. Good. Okay. In Jesus Christ, Amen. Amen. Gail O'Day, the author of a wonderful commentary on the Gospel of John, offers this. The image of community that emerges from John 15, 1-17 is one of interrelationship, mutuality, and indwelling. To get the full sense of this interrelationship, it is helpful to visualize what the branches of a vine actually look like. In a vine, branches are almost completely indistinguishable from one another. It's impossible to determine where one branch stops and another branch starts. All run together as they grow out of the central vine. What this vine image suggests about community, then, is that there are no freestanding individuals in the community, but branches who encircle one another completely. The fruitfulness of each individual branch depends on its relationship to the vine and nothing else. To live according to this model, then, the church would be a community in which members are known for the acts of love they do in common with all other members. It would not be a community built around individual accomplishments, choices, or rights, but around shared accountability to the abiding presence of Jesus and common enactment of the love of God and Jesus." End quote. As I envision these branches completely encircling one another, I am both wrapped in a feeling of protective love like snuggling up in a prayer shawl on a tough day. But I'm also more than a bit claustrophobic, wanting to shake free of that level of closeness and get out for some fresh air. But what I want to focus on here is that best sense of close connection. That sense that wherever you are, whatever your circumstances, whatever negativity you may be dealing with in your self-talk, or your social media chatter. You are a beloved child of God. 
you are held in the love of a community that understands itself as fed and nurtured and connected to the brave, life-affirming love of Jesus. Now, that is not intended by John or Jesus as a calling to be one of those old-fashioned, life-limiting tight-knit groups that asserts community norms on anyone who strays. No, we are to be a branch of Christ's own love, continuing the flow of empowering, nurturing goodness that begins in Christ the Vine. This coming week is designated as Mental Health Week, a time for uh, what David Robertson called us to in last week's message, uh, to have compassion for oneself and to lean into the care of community. It may also be a time for a gentle check-in. If you are concerned about someone who has kind of disappeared from notice, and as much as we don't want to cross a boundary or be intrusive, I can tell you firsthand from my lost year, 22 years ago, how important it is in those hard times to be reminded, A, that you are not invisible, and B, that your situation is not so unique that you are beyond care or assistance, or if needed, therapeutic intervention. To be connected to the vine that is Jesus Christ is to be totally connected to love. It is to hold in our prayers and actions God's own highest intentions for the life of another. Christ's act of hope that your journey of life will be supported and guided by love. That is a hope for you and for me, for us together in our local congregations, for the United Church of Canada, and for all churches who claim the name of Jesus Christ. We are to be branches that enable love to flow freely and graciously in all lives and situations where love needs to be known to share that goodness of the vine of Christ. In that spirit, friends, please join with me now in a responsive prayer produced for Mental Health Week by the United Church of Canada and the United Church of Christ. Following my words, God in your mercy, the unison response is hear our prayer. Friends, let us pray. God of love, we celebrate that today you are still speaking a word of acceptance, wholeness and inclusion to all of your differently abled people. We give thanks for your call to the church to seek to live out Jesus' commandment to love you and to love our neighbors as ourselves. As we enter this time of prayer, we pause for a moment to bring to mind the people and situations that are most on our hearts, lifting them to you in silent prayer. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. On this Mental Health Sunday, we pray for people who live with untreated mental illness and who are unable to find help and cannot afford medical care. We pray for an end to the stigma of mental illness. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for families torn apart by mental health diseases and for families that hold on to one another during difficult times of illness. We pray 
in particular for those who have lost a loved one to suicide. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for mental health caregivers, for scientific researchers, and for professionals who seek to bring compassion, treatment, and healing to those who suffer from brain diseases. We pray for children, teens, and young adults learning how to live with newly diagnosed brain diseases. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for people burdened by labels and stereotypes. We pray for people who are victims of bullying and discrimination because of their disability. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the many gifts that people with mental health disease bring into the world. We celebrate the creative genius of artists, scientists, authors, scholars, business and government leaders, actors, musicians, inventors who live with mental illness. Still speaking God, as the mysteries of the human brain unfold, we remain in awe of the intricate ways in which we are created in your image. May we be reflections of your love in this world. Amen. Thank you.
On Sunday, May the 9th, all communities of faith within Chinook Winds region will be having a shared worship service. This will be broadcast on the Chinook Winds region, the United Church of Canada YouTube channel. The service begins at 10.30 a.m. Mountain Time. There will be no other YouTube service on May the 9th for Ralph Connor or Rundle, but worship will return to our Ralph Connor Canmore YouTube channel on May 16th. And just so it gets said in advance, Happy Mother's Day. Our service of worship today ends with these words of blessing. God of love, plant us in the soil of your grace. Nurture us with the strength of Christ, the vine of everlasting life. Enlighten us with the wisdom of your spirit, which flows through us today and all days. Abide in us that we may abide in you and live in your love. As we have worshipped in this time set aside, may we engage the world now in your holy name, Creator, Christ, and Spirit. Amen.